and welcome to World Inside with Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, the DPRK test fires more missiles over the weekend while military drills between the U.S. and South Korea are underway. Could this set off a fresh battle of nerves in the Korean Peninsula? And can you imagine surviving in an icy wilderness for three weeks? I sit down with Iwan Xu, who shows and tells us all about the awe-inspiring moments from his experience in the film China to Siberia, crossing the loneliness lake. And we begin our show today with the DPRK, which test-fired three short-range projectiles over the weekend. The launch ends a month-long pause in Pyongyang's missile tests. Earlier this month, the U.S. and the DPRK exchanged barbs, with Pyongyang threatening to launch missiles near the U.S. territory of Guam in the Pacific. However, the latest the missiles weared off Guam. Instead, they headed east. Pyongyang said the launch of three missiles was a success. But Washington, on the other hand, said it was a failure. Before we go to today's discussion to find out exactly what happened, take a look at this. After a long pause, Pyongyang was at it again. The DPRK went all out with three short-range missiles on Saturday. The missiles flew about 250 kilometers into the sea off the east coast, which is close to Japan. Washington says one missile exploded shortly after liftoff and the others flew into the sea. Pyongyang also staged a simulated invasion of bordering islands to mark the 57th anniversary of the Day of Songun, a military commemoration, and Kim Jong-un supervised the drills. This came as the ROK and the U.S. carried out joint military exercises, something Pyongyang feared was an invasion rehearsal. In response to the tests, Japan sounded the alarm against the DPRK. We were not able to confirm any ballistic missile entering Japanese territories or any exclusive economic zone. We were able to confirm that the launch did not pose a direct threat to Japan's national security. The missile tests also alarmed Pyongyang's big neighbor in its western border, China. Beijing followed through with the latest round of sanctions on the DPRK. The Ministry of Commerce announced a ban on DPRK individuals and enterprises from doing new business in China. Elsewhere on Monday, South Korean President Moon Jae-in ordered the military to immediately switch to an offensive footing if the DPRK crosses the line. He added it was issued to achieve a real defense reform. Tensions in the Korean Peninsula had eased somewhat after the DPRK said it would hold off on launching missiles towards Guam. But the recent tests and the ongoing military drill between South Korea and the U.S. means they're back to square one. So could the DPRK's latest missile tensions on the Korean Peninsula once again to a head? Let's ask our panel. With us in Beijing, we have Ms. He Wenping, professor at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences with us in Seoul, South Korea. We are joined by Yun Zhang Lim, who is an assistant professor with the College of International Relations of Ritsumeikan University in Boston. We are joined by Jim Walsh, the Security Studies Program Researcher of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Welcome to the three of you. I want to begin with Ms. Lim. According to the South Korean sources, uh, tests were done, and we are not clear at this point whether they are successful or not. Or actually, we don't even know where they is heading for. Yes, you're totally right. Uh, not only just you know uh, their own uh, capability, even their intention is always has been kind of blurred. But I do think uh, they uh, still do have a kind of firm intention, and I guess their firm intention is um, estranging us. Here, us refers to uh, six party minus North Korea, which means again the South Korea, China, Japan, the United States, and Russia. They do know how differently we react to the uh, different uh, range of missiles. So I do think, I do guess, that, that's my only guess, mm. but I do guess they uh, want to, I mean, they, uh, they intend, again, the, uh, the diversify uh, the, uh, the reactions from us that's right. the rest of there us. There are diversified reactions, and I'm going to one, mention one of those, which might be coming from China, that is, or North Korea, that is, there are military exercises going on between South Korea and the United States. Mr. Walsh, according to Pyongyang, that is exactly what happened and that is exactly what led to their test on missiles. Yeah, so I have, uh, let me offer, I don't know if it's true, but let me offer a very different way of thinking about this. 
Uh, every year we have military exercises. And every year North Korea does something in response to those missile uh, exercises. I mean those uh, military exercises. And North Korea has been on this unbelievable testing pace. I mean, they're testing, they're testing, they're testing, you know, dozens every year. So the idea that they weren't, we're going to stop testing seems unlikely to me. We're having war games. They're going to do testing. Okay. But it may be, it may be that, that they have dialed it back a little, right? These were three short-range missiles. They're not ballistic missiles. They don't throw, pay, pay uh, form the same sort of threats that other missiles were, they can't carry a nuclear warhead. So this allows them to test, that is to say, to respond to the military exercises, right. but turn it down a notch. And it may be, and I have no idea, that the U.S. military exercises turned it down a notch. And so both sides are doing what they normally do, but maybe at a little lower level to signal that we still want to be able to talk to each other and that possibilities still remain. Okay. That would be an alternative. Here, here, here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. The real question, Ms. Go. It's up to you to your answer. So, despite all of these things going on, the military exercises, South Korea, United States, and the North Koreans set three projectiles. We don't know exactly where it's heading for. Are they all dramas on the very surface? Be Side this drama, under it, there are real things going on? Or, actually, Ms. He, all these dramas are exactly all the things that are going on. What well, would you say? Yeah, on the surface, it's like a kind of drama. But beneath that, I think uh, both of the, the two sides are testing the water, testing the bottom of line of those policy. Because we all know earlier this uh, the August, those two almost you know stand off and even threatening use the nuclear power. So from the DPRK, they're threatening targeting the Guam Island, and also from the U.S. perspective, mm. even uh, President Trump saying yeah, all the world we are going to see uh, unprecedented presidential nuclear power. So this is a quite uh, very unprecedented, this kind of standoff. So I think that both of them are testing the water to see what is the right. bottom of this policy. Well, they are testing water. If you want to see how the waters are being tested, let's take a look at some of the timelines. August 26, DPRK launched three short-range ballistic missiles. Two flew for 240 kilometers. One blew up almost instantly. And these particular missiles only threatened South Korea, according to the range. But Kwa Song 14 missiles launched earlier this year have an estimated range of 10,000 kilometers, putting the U.S. heartland really at risk. Meanwhile, the U.S. has allowed South Korea to test the Hyunmu 2 missiles with the range of limit of 800 kilometers. So to balance the DPRK's growing nuclear and missile uh, threat. So we see a lot of things going on all at the same time, which is the truth or relatively closer to the truth. Uh, Ms. Lim, your judgment also. Again, my uh, answer can remain pretty similar uh, with my previous answers. I do think uh, they do know how differently we react, mm. which means um, they want to show different or diverse uh, risk uh, occasionally or sometimes simultaneously to see our reactions. So the point is we, I mean the five party at least, we really have to have a strong consensus, from consensus and we have to behave collectively. If we do show any different gaps between us, they will, that's what exactly I do think uh, Pyongyang uh, wants to see. Well, here's so the interesting in that sense, thing. I don't think they, mm. Here's an interesting thing. I have to jump mm -hmm. in here, Ms. Lim. For example, China did not want to be kidnapped by Pyongyang. That's only fair, right? Nobody wants to be kidnapped by another country. But China does not want to be kidnapped by the interests of the United States or South Korea alone, either. And I guess the other way around, for South Korea, United States, to work one another with the other parties in the six-party talks. So the differences in opinions is obvious. But the thing is, through what kinds of mechanism, through what kinds of concerted efforts together can we build more trust? I think that is the crucial and the most crucial issue. So Ms. He, if on that point I could invite your views here, more tests, does it bring trust or does it bring distrust? 
uh, of course bring uh, the distrust because those uh, testing water issue I think uh, can further you know uh, make those gap between the mutual trust even wider uh, because nobody knows so which is the, the bottom so you are constantly testing testing and then the, the bottom you haven't seen mm. so maybe as for to the some point maybe there will be some clash of those uh, uh, confrontation so who knows so a lot of people uh, just worry so much if those uh, missile t uh, testing and somehow there is some mistake so who can imagine uh, the South Korea right. I think is on the front line of uh, those uh, uh, will be the weak team. Well, South Korea will be, but the other parties are also likely to suffer diplomatically or in other ways as well. Uh, uh, Mr. Walsh, though, there is an interesting perspective about this. I mean, you see two earlier very severe and serious nuclear tests from the DPRK. According to the latest news coming from the South Korean side, the NCI, as they say, the Intelligence Service of South Korea, there's likely to be movements uh, suggesting a possible third test. Well, of course, at this point, nobody could, concern, could be confirming about that. And sometimes those intelligence were being used as a way for negotiation. We also know that. But the thing is, are parties prepared for if there were any nuclear test in the future. We are in the action, reaction, reaction, action mode. We all know that as well. So, yes. Yes. what's next, Mr. Walsh? Well, I, I think you put your finger on something important, and that is we often pay attention to what Korea, North Korea does uh, rather than paying attention to what it doesn't do. And they haven't had a nuclear test, and most of us would say that they've been ready to have one that is technically prepared to have one since I don't know March and we're expecting uh, a test at least on two previous occasions when there were major North Korean holidays so the fact that they haven't tested I take as a sign of restraint and so if you take that as a sign of restraint and maybe this missile test which is sort of low-level short-range projectiles maybe that's a hint at yeah. restraint and then, then you can begin to build some momentum but one of the issues here is both sides as I say the US and South Korea and North Korea they both have uh, two two faced policies in, in the sense that they uh, or two track policies they both want to appear very strong and run military acts and you know right. show their military might at the same time that they're also at least I think behind the scenes certainly in the US side and the at the New York Channel they seem to be engaging in some some dialogues, some, some very quiet dialogue. All so right. I think you have both a sort of aggressiveness and, and a deterrent signal and a let's talk signal. And that can be confusing to us who is watching from the outside. Well, I guess you'd be less confused than us because Boston is really not that far from New York, Mr. Walsh. I really have to know some information from you <laughs> as to what exactly is going on there in New York. Do you know any more information than we already talked about? Well, it has been confirmed in the press that jo Ambassador Joe Yoon has been talking with the North Koreans for some time. We know that they used diplomacy to remove Otto Wambier, uh, who was the American being detained there. Mm -hmm. And those talks have continued. And you had over the weekend Secretary Tillerson, uh, whose comments have really evolved over time. Uh, you have Secretary Tillerson emphasizing peaceful resolution to the issue. Uh, and use of diplomacy, uh, he, by diplomacy in this case he means sanctions and pressure, but in any case he emphasized the word peaceful in his description of the U.S. policy. Right. So I do think there's been some movement and much of it is, is behind the scenes, uh, but I haven't been sitting in on those meetings. Right. Ms. Lim, actually it's not just Secretary Tillerson, it's also the U.S. military officials in the Pacific region that have been talking about peaceful solutions not through military means not long for ago so are we seeing signs of both sides trying to calm down the water at least for now and allow just a window opportunity as slight as we could have at this point for some talks are we really seeing the first light of the tunnel Um, compared to um, two, three weeks uh, ago, I mean, the, we really did see a, a kind of high tensions, verbal tensions between the Washington and the uh, Pyongyang. Mm -hmm. Compared to those moments, of course, it looks like uh, it has come down. 
but underneath the uh, surface, probably the fundamental momentum didn't dis disappear or didn't change that that mm -hmm. much, uh, which means we always do have this kind of you know potential risk. So probably again, of course, I can't agree more. I mean, the, with the uh, Mr. Uh, Wash, uh, we at some point we really need to have uh, have a dialogue fully. I mean, with the uh, Pyongyang. But again, I uh, want to really uh, suggest. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the 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 other, the rest of us really have to have a consensus uh, before again the Pyongyang um, and Washington or whoever. Uh, or even six Ms. Lim, you keep on talking too, about consensus. Yes, uh -huh. You keep on mm -hmm. talking about consensus, but mm -hmm. it's not easy, especially after what have all happened. There were tests coming from DPRK oh. at any time that could be possible, missiles, projectiles, and could be even nuclear. And we don't know what the reaction is going to be oh. from all sides. Secondly, you also got a lot of things going on between even China and South Korea. The sad uh, China and Russia see as a permanent threat to these two countries. When you say we have to have a consensus, where does the consensus come from if those difficulties are not being solved? Ms. Lim. Of course it's not easy. Of course it's not easy. Consensus building, even domestic consensus building is not easy in any country. But that is why we need to have a, a, you know, dialogues before actually we open up uh, the dialogue to Pyongyang. I mean, between us, I mean, we really do have to uh, have uh, more dialogues and more communications. I mean, the, to build a consensus. It's a kind of procedural thing. It's not a, you know, I don't think it's a one click magical, uh, magical process. Uh -huh. So in that sense, I really want to see the uh, Chinese leadership here or uh, U.S. So American leadership here, I really truly hope, I mean, that my new administration, South Korean new administration, can have an uh, uh, initiative too. But as long as we do enjoy this economic prosperity and the freedom okay. here in the rest of us, I mean, the, of the, our countries, I think we really have to uh, deal with this, I mean, more seriously. Ms. Ho, mm -hmm. here in China, has China demonstrated the leadership as the Ms. Lin was expecting. It seems that China has joined the sanctions. China has been calling on all parties, calm down, please don't try to bring it to another higher notch, the tensions. Has China demonstrated its leadership? What is leadership to you, Ms. He? Oh, of course, I think China has been always serving this kind of uh, mediation role. This is a kind of leadership because our colleagues mentioned this uh, consensus, you know, the consensus building. Mm. But the consensus building, of course, needs a table. That's a negotiation table. So this negotiation table, China has been offered a long, long time ago. That is six-party talks. But unfortunately, these six-party talks uh, hasn't uh, generated a good results because of those uh, trust, mutual trust that hasn't been built on. Right. Because those uh, uh, mutual testing water issue, I think has been, uh, you know, uh, up, uh, uh, you know, upgraded those level of both those arm race and then we see those bad consequences right. has been show up one by one. The sad deployment in South Korea and also this testing also make this North Korea's their, uh, you know, missile building now becoming more capable than before. And also from the U.S. side, uh, they joined together with South Korea and then make those uh, joint uh, drill also uh, upgraded one one by one. So I think uh, right now China's leadership shows another way. That is the idea now we put forward. It's called a double suspension. Mm -hmm. So one suspension is those uh, joint uh, military uh, drill should be should be hot, should be suspended, and also we can push the North Korea also you know suspended their missile test. That's right. You know what? At the very beginning, double suspension it has not been reported in any other country rather than China, and toward today. We are hearing enormous amount of reporting in South Korea and in the United States as well through public networks and even some of the networks uh, that are quite hot these days on social media talking about double suspension. What does it really mean, Ms. Walsh? Uh, are we, all parties, getting ever closer to a consensus about that? There has to be some carrots and sticks together. It cannot be just sticks all the time. So, Ms. Walsh, you have to help us find a way. Where is the central point to you? Well, I'm doing the best I can. Oh, you. please. Um, that's a joke. Oh, well, come the, on. Uh, the, um, you know, I, I think the consensus, I think there is, part, uh, I agree with my colleagues that, that it, it'll, diplomacy will work best if everyone's on the same page. We're all going to have the same identical views because we don't have the same interests. So we're going to disagree about some things, but the question is whether you can still agree about the core. Mm. And it seems to me that China's core policy here is denuclearization, which they've been quite public and quite direct about. Right. And that is the policy of the United States. 
denuclearization. And it's the policy of uh, China, I mean, of uh, Japan and South Korea. So I think there is uh, some uh, uh, consensus there. I think as tensions rose, especially three weeks ago, okay. and people started to get really, really nervous, then uh, the, the, the paradox is the more debt come, the more people uh, try harder for a peaceful resolution. All I right. think we, what we're going to have to do is wait for the conclusion of these exercises and then see if, if, if things pick up with momentum with the conclusion of these military exercises. Oh, is that really what we're facing right now? Ms. Klo, final words from you very briefly, one sentence or two. Yeah, I think, uh, of course, the interests are shared the same thing, denuclearization. But mm. the process maybe now is different. Okay. Some are saying using the war as a threat weapon. Some are saying the negotiation should be the right uh, access. All right. Ms. Lin, one sentence for you as well. Again, I think uh, we can t work together, definitely. Uh, the more important thing is how strong a will we do have. All right, those are crucial mm -hmm. questions, of course. We're going to discuss further about that in near future as guests. Uh, for now, thank you so much, He Wenping, Jin Zhang Lin, Jim Walsh. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You're watching World Inside with Tianwei, coming to you live from Beijing, still to come on our program. Imagine 23 days out in the cold, far from civilization, trying to survive. That's what director Adam Xu did on the film China to Siberia, crossing the loneliest lake. And he tells all in a sit down with me right after this break. Yes, you're watching World Inside with Tian Wei. Have you ever imagined that someone could walk through the Lake Bacal alone without any mechanical support? Well, this has been accomplished by this young Chinese gentleman. Xu Zhengren spent 23 days walking 700 kilometers through the deserted wilderness at 30 degrees below zero. He was the eighth person on the planet who made the crossing from the south side to the north. Before he went on his icy adventure, he rode by bike through as many as 36 countries across Asia, Africa, and Europe. Other achievements also including riding across the United States and walks through Caucasia. Born in the 1980s, she and many others have becoming new models of adventure spirit among the youth here in China. Tell me about that trip. Uh, so in the past winter, I went to uh, Siberia, Russia. I was there for about three months, and I was preparing uh, for the biggest trip in my life, which uh, was to travel across Baikal from south to north for almost 700 uh, kilometers. And yeah, I prepared for like 45 days in Siberia, and then I walked uh, 23 days across Baikal. So that was really exciting. At the very beginning, yeah. Jiang Jun, you were traveling with the Russian guy. Yeah. He was supposed to be your guide, while at the same time providing support to you. Uh, he was more like a travel companion. I he, see. He, is, he wasn't really my guide, because he had the same idea and same dream to traverse Baikal. He said uh, it's a great trip and adventure for our Siberian men. How did do. you find him? Uh, through a common friend uh, whose name is uh, Cozy. Uh, before I went to Russia in July, uh, I Skyped with Fyodor four times, and I can sense that he really likes adventure, and he, re he knows Baikal really well. He understands code, code travel very well, and he's very no profile. Mm. And that's what I like the most, because I think as a travel companion uh, in the very uh, harsh conditions like Lake Baikal in winter. Yeah. I think it's very important that you have a no profile personality because if you, if you just want to be famous then that's not that's not uh, a good start because if you're trying to be a hero and that's dangerous you mm. you may not judge very well. Uh, but if you just love adventure and love the idea to travel across Baikal itself I think that's more like a good companion uh, to go with because try to be a hero is dangerous. Try, try to just live another life. That's, I think that's the key. So you didn't want to be a hero? Well, this is what I want to do. I mean, you know, that's not my goal to become a hero. It's, it's just my dream. The trip to do itself. It. Yeah. But then your travel companion mm -hmm. forgot to bring his 
snow goggles. Mm -hmm. As a result, he became slow blind. Yeah. And he has to quit. Mm -hmm. But at the very beginning, you were trying to provide him with your own snow goggles so that he could survive the trip. It didn't work out. Uh, I think he, I think he kind of underestimated uh, you know, the trip on Baikal because I think he understands slow blindness really well mm. uh, because he's also a mountaineer guide, which means he goes to the mountain, he guides people to the mountain very often. So he knows the situation very well and he has the same problem before, only in the mountains. Yeah. And in Baikal, usually in March, uh, in the southern part of Baikal, usually it's more of ice. So everything is ice. It's not really slow. Mm -hmm. But this year in March, the first six days, it slowed really heavy every day, like five days out of six. I see. So everywhere is white. And that's just kind of very abnormal this year. This when year. you gave him the snow goggle, uh, did you realize that you were probably the one that's likely to also suffer from snow blind as a result of it? I knew the situation of slow band before, so I prepared really well. I mm. have two pair of uh, glasses. I one see. is sunglasses, one's goggle. So I can I can lend him I can I can uh, lend him my goggle and keep my sunglasses. It also can protect my eyes. But at the time he was suffering too much, he had to quit. Mm -hmm. That meant you have to be alone, right. only on your own. Right. From then on. Right. What was it like? <laughs> I didn't really uh, wish that he quit. I wished he uh, would go with me of because course. he's really experienced and he's really strong, as strong as a bear, I would say. <laughs> because Did he know that analogy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think he knew that. Because before our trip, I went for a hike and camping trip with him in a Siberian forest called Taiga. Yeah, yeah he carried really big, heavy backpack and still walked faster than me. And that was just unbelievable. And his knowledge uh, on how to survive in the cold is also really amazing. Mm. So I think he trains me a lot, and he's really strong, and he knows back how really well. What did he train you about? Uh, like different things. For example, when we were walking in, in the Siberian forest, when we go downhills, like he walked really fast, like from, from a, a, like a, a top of a small mountain to the bottom really fast, and then walk yes. really slow. Like he would yell at the bottom of the mountain. He said, <laughs> Ivan, be fast. Your brain is, is smarter than your legs. Just walk. But that's not training. That's, that's urging. Well, you know, his training is very different. His training <laughs> is very harsh. It's, it's, not, it's not very fun that he is your, you know, is your trainer or helps tough you. Tough love, I guess. Yes, very, very tough love. You, know, it's, <laughs> you, know, you, you, you love him afterwards. Yeah. But when you're training with him, you hate him, you know. So that was a really scary moment when he said maybe he cannot uh, go with me anymore because his eyes just, he had double vision when he seen things. He That's really two. problematic. Yeah. yeah, and he felt like there, there were sand uh, in his eyes. He ha has to quit and that was a very scary moment because I always want to go with a Russian partner for this trip because I'm not very confident in, in code, especially on the ice. <laughs> 肉体上基本上都很非常痛所以他昨天早上搭车回伊尔库斯克然后刚刚因为到了奥尔康岛真的是一个手机信号的刚刚跟他通电话他说他眼睛比较严重需要不少于几天的休息时间所以他肯定不
Yes. I have talked to all the people who have similar experience, for example, who climb mountains, who go to Antarctica for mm -hmm. expeditions. And I have talked to the people who travel on Baikal. I've talked with local people. I have trained in Siberian forest. I have even practiced swimming in cold water in January in Siberia. <laughs> Just to get used to the water. You yeah, know. just what if, right? Yeah, You're cracking if into the uh, snow and also under the ice. Right, exactly. So you know, why not, you know, go hard for these three weeks and then, you know, go home, rest, you know, for as long as I want and be proud for the rest of my life.女性探险早期可能要觉得初夏风和这是, uh, uh, I mean, there is always a chance you, you, you may die. You can even die in the cities, you know, you can get hit by a car, you know. So, uh, I mean, there is always risk for that. I you have the burning desire to go. Yeah. Just like that. How yeah. long did it take you to make that decision? Um, I think maybe like one day, because uh, Fjord left in day eight. And day nine and day ten, I'm near the island Arhon, which mm -hmm. is kind of a central part of uh, Baikal. It, it's a, a touristic destination, so there is transportation. Yes. Over there, I can decide to go back or continue. If I continue, then there's there is no way that you're going to return. What did you do during those two days? Uh, I was Had some vodka or what? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Uh, <laughs> I was still walking because I tried to reach the village Hujir. Uh, over there, there are hostels. Yes. So I, re I reached there at day 10, and then day 11, it was a rest day. And then I get my, all my uh, resupply for food and fuel, and then I have to make a decision, should I go or just return to Irkutsk and go back to China? Mm. Uh, so I, it took one day to make that decision. But somewhere deep down, I know that I would continue. Um, you know, to find an excuse to go home is comfortable, but that's not the right thing to do. That's not you. That's, that's not me, and that's not the right thing to do. Sometimes the easier way is not the right way. The harder way is the right way. Mm -hmm. Have you ever regretted from time to time your original decision, or at least have a second thought, <sighs> just for a second? Yeah, yeah. Th there, were, there were two times, I think, one night, uh, maybe day 16 or 17, something like that, uh, I was in my tent, and the wind was blowing really strong. I saw that moment, huh? Yeah, it was really scary because uh, I wasn't really sure my tent was strong enough to survive in, in, in the wind uh, because on Baikal it's, it's very, very wide. Uh, there's nothing, it's very flat on, on the lake. That's so, right. so it's very, very windy. It's very scary because if your tent is blown away, then you're done. You're so done, you yeah. And also there was ice under you. Yeah. And yet there are huge cracks. You could hear, you could hear the sound of the cracks yeah. while you were sleeping. Yeah, yeah. It must yeah. be sweet dreams, I guess, for that <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that was maybe something like day 20. Mm -hmm. uh, I was camping on the ice. Uh, when you're on the ice, you, know, you can hear the sound of ice cracking. And usually for the people who go there for the first few times, it's really, really scary. But you know that fear is just just your your instinct. But you never know. Um, you never know. Yeah, there is a chance that you, you were crack very big, you were fall into the water. But it's chance it's small if mm. you read uh, if you read other people's experience. You know, but how did you fight against your fear? I mean, you have to go to sleep because you have a whole day to go the mm -hmm. next day. I took the prevention. I think I bought uh, uh, earplugs. Earplugs. It says. Does it work? It says the best earplugs <laughs> in the world. <laughs> 
So when I get scared, on the lake of a cow, right? On the lake of a cow, yeah. So when I feel scared, I just put the the world's best earplugs <laughs> there, and then I don't hear it. So much noise, but it's still scary. Yeah. And then I told myself, this is irrational fear. You just don't think about it. You're gonna be fine. You know, if if the ice is gonna crack for real, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. Just. How did you fight loneliness besides talking to your unprofessional camera? <laughs> um, so I have audio books in my phone. Yeah. That I listen sometimes. What kind of books? All kinds of、uh, stories that I feel、uh, that I can learn learn lessons from other people. Uh, this is also keep me sane,、mm -hmm. so you know my my brain's active. Which any of those stories really you want to listen over and over again?、Uh, it's about Einstein. Einstein. Yeah, yeah. So Einstein kept you walking. Yeah, and also I mean, under the lake is really beautiful.、Uh, some、right. parts was incredible, incredibly beautiful, and I've never seen things like that. The shore or mountains covered with snow, and. The sunset and sunrise usually are incredibly beautiful. Yeah. And you know, there's no other people, just me. Just right. Just me.、Uh, that I can, I can, I can enjoy the view.、So、that's your world. That's my reward. Actually,、uh, most of the time, I don't really have, I don't really spend a lot of time to enjoy to savor to savor the the sunset,、um, because because I only have、uh, limited daytime. I was trying to cover more distance,、yes. and uh, I, and uh, when I stop, I camp. So I don't really have a lot of time to do that usually. But when something really beautiful, I stop. You know, I took my、uh, thermal bottle, I drink some tea, I eat some snacks, and then I, I enjoy that. How can you, at the same time, so elevated by the fact that you are there, and the world, on the lake of Bacow, with that beautiful sunrise and sunset,、mm -hmm. all yours? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, keep your posture、mm -hmm. very calm. I just don't know how it worked out.、Mm -hmm. Help me to understand it.、Uh, like I said before, I went、uh, before I started my trip.、Uh, Fiora told me, "Don't try to be a hero.、Uh, just try to live another life."、Yeah. Uh, that's very important、uh, because you you don't really you don't really get、um, so excited because the view every day every day the view is pretty much great. So you don't get Overly excited. Yeah. Do you think you are responsible for your family when you are making all of those decisions?、Mm -hmm. For me, for me, it's very important to keep a balance, a good balance to、um, to to pursue my dream and also go home safe.、Uh, that's that's a balance. That's a, that's a balance which is very hard to keep sometimes, but that's the balance I try to keep. You know. You are becoming this rising star in China in terms of doing adventures. I may wonder how is that shaping your idea about yourself and your ideas about what to do for the future and why you are going to do it. I think、uh, doing adventures and going so many places.、Uh, I think it gave me, it, it makes me want to become a better person,、uh, want to be a good person. Uh, the reason I would say that is, for example, when I was in Baikal, when I was in Russia, Siberia,、uh, many people helped me. For example, the hostel I stayed、uh, before my trip, I stayed there 45 days. The hostel owner、uh, told me I don't have to pay、mm -hmm. because he support what I do and he believes what I do has a lot of values can inspire people.、Wow. And for example,、um, people in Russia, people give me free gears that they think I need. Give me socks.、Mm -hmm. uh, give me some clothes. They think I might be able to use it. People lend me their sled. They、right. think it's、uh, very useful to 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 have in Baikal. So many people helped me because Siberia is a place where they have very large land, but they have very few people, and it's a very harsh place when it's really cold in winter. So it's really hard to survive alone. In Siberia,、mm -hmm. uh, so they ha people have the habits to help each other, help strangers in、right. Siberia. Many places in America, Europe, everywhere, and in in Azerbaijan, in Georgia, the places I've traveled,、uh, people helped me. And the only way, and I, I I will probably never meet these people again. The only way that I can repay them, the only way I can repay them is to pay it forward. You know, to to become a good person. Xu Jiangjun and his trip to Siberia. What a story! 
And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside with Tianwei CGTN in your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Tianwei Weibo, all shown here on our screen. From me, Tianwei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. And tune in again tomorrow for insights across China, around the world. Good night.